Banazek, 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 Banazek. Okay, it's been a long enough time since I've done a chapter uh, from my book, Weasels in a Box. So this is, uh, we are up to book one, chapter three. God damn it, I haven't slept since we left. Franklin gets a mischievous pleasure from talking out loud while he is pissing. His voice echoes off the worn-out tile covering the cold cement flooring and reflects off the cracks and folds in the moistened, yellowing wallpaper. He stares at you over the partitions in between the urinals at a rest area, somewhere on Utah's midnight desolate highways. The fluorescent bulbs loosely attached to wires in the ceiling flicker on and off while making a clicking sound like conversing crickets both of you have backseat bed head and cheeks and chins covered with patches of stubble. Every time I fucking close an eye, that bucktooth scamp presses her booted hoof harder against an accelerator. She's either going to get us locked up in a Hicktown prison or crashes into a monstrous herd of goats prancing across this tumbleweed-infested wasteland. He gives his willy a final shake. Why did you talk me into driving there with these... Why did you talk me into driving there with these two wacky broads? Ever since Jerry Lewis, with tears in his eyes, called Lucille Ball a wacky broad in an interview about her recent death, Franklin has incorporated the phrase into his colorful vocabulary. It was your idea to bring them along. Thanks for reminding me, bedbug. That's a new twisting of your stage name. You kind of like it. Punk friends love taking your name and twisting it. It's quite entertaining. Bedbug is fitting in this situation because insects are crawling around the floor and flying into exposed bulbs. <laughs> exposed bulbs. It was a good idea, Chief. We couldn't have afforded it otherwise. No, we couldn't. That's a fact. We had to spend all our hard-earned cash on flights for those other two goons because they didn't have the time to suffer a 4,000-mile crucifixion. We're fucking martyrs for a bunch of nobodies. Soul Food and Limburger. My first trip to California in a band, and it's entirely funded not by my talent as a songwriter, but because we are adequate enough to scrape away rust and paint walls and gutters and the b bonostic... Wow, what did I... That's... See, Ben would use interesting words, so I think was, I was trying to use interesting words here. Banausik. 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 Maybe I'll, I'll uh, give the definition in the, in the afterwards, but uh, it's probably something to do with banal. Oh, here, 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 I think it's explained. Uh, banausik, shade of mother of pearl. Banausik, I say? Learned it yesterday. Just thought I'd try it out. Well, your parents' house looks much better for it, Franklin. Bonostic or not. Those fucking gunners didn't even need painting. Franklin uses the word fuck in abundance. It takes on different cadences depending on the situation in which it is used. This particular usage is complicated in its layers. He is upset that he had to resort to pointless labor in order to achieve a goal. So the fuck has a frustrated, strongly exaggerated f sound. There is some embarrassment, there is some embarrassment in the center of the word, focusing largely on the uh sound. He has to work every day, practice on weekends, spend hours writing his songs while simultaneously teaching himself to play chords on the guitar, and write columns for minimal backlash. And he still doesn't have the cash to pay for his own trip. It is not necessarily a hard life, but it is still incredibly confounding. His parents acknowledge his manic effort to control his surroundings and proudly accept it. And they may feel themselves partly responsible for the trouble their son often experiences. They offer a painting job to help finance a trip, enough money for the flights, 
and a portion of the gas. This is embarrassing for a young man that has constantly struggled against the grain to forge a genuine independence. Finally, there is the present participle. There is the present part. <laughs> That's a grammar term. Uh, there is a there is the present participle hanging at the end of this complicated word. The ing is somewhat mild and contradicts the crass explosion of the. Th it is swallowed and internalized, softening the effect of the provocative word, fuck. He has a respect for his parents, and he is silently thankful that they want to help. They are still supportive after all the troublesome years he gave them while growing up, running away numerous times, dropping and are getting kicked out of more than five high schools, a few arrests, minor drug problems, and hours upon hours and inflammatory arguments meant more to hurt feelings than to resolve issues. I can't believe I used the word fuck to explain his relationship with his parents. Uh, you know, never, you know, Ben never uh, talked to me about how he, th what he thought about me uh, talking about his personal life so much. Um, I'm surprised. Uh, anyway, back to it. You both walk out in the parking lot. He lights a cigarette. You walk over to a garbage can and place a bottle that you picked up off the ground into it. Franklin walks over to you. Damn it, those two mooches should have helped us raise some money, or at least come over to clean over to clean paint brushes and No, oh, let me say that again. Damn it, those two mooches should have helped raise some money, or at least come over to clean paint brushes and cheer us on. I know they should have. I'm not going to be buried in Utah. He has had enough of the painting conversation, so he instantaneously reignites his intentionally humorous fury. She has to slow down. My clenched fists and stiff jaw will not tolerate much more of this reckless behavior. This first and only drive to California with Amber and Marianne was one of the longest, most frightful trips in the whole of your touring career. 4,000 miles non-stop through deserts, mountains, snow, and rain with a rusted battery cable that made the headlights dim when anyone pressed on the brakes and threadbare tires that hadn't been changed since the old lady parked the dusty car in her garage years and years before Franklin even had a license to drive. Amber got a little carried away with the accelerator while driving through the west, driving about 20 miles over the speed limit with only one eye on the road. That seemed to be a shitload over the limit to you, then, for someone who doesn't drive much yet. You didn't consider the speed excessive because of your joyfully blind obedience to the laws governing this vast and politically inconsistent country. No, you considered it, you considered it excessive mostly to cover up for your paranoia of getting in trouble with the local authorities, and for the fair... And for the fear you shared with Mr. Famous of driving off a cliff or into the side of an abnormally abnormally portioned goat. Um, you know, I'm going to stop here. You know, I, I was think I was messing up a lot there because I had this thought in my head about how uh, I think part of this book was to explore the, at least part of it for me, about my character was to explore this idea of of being perceived as a as a good guy but uh, questioning that on the inside of whether my intentions were always good or whether I made them look so in order to get away with something. Uh, it's something I think about all the time. So anyway, get out of that seat. I'm driving. I'm fucking tired of telling you to slow down. Quite frankly, I don't think there is any reason for you ever to sit in that seat again. Get in the back seat, hell kitten, and don't you dare flash your claws at me. Why don't you leave her alone? Marianne pipes up in a mousy voice. You get in the back seat too, you wet rat. Hey, girls, why don't you get some rest? I think we're all just a little tired. Franklin is just trying to prevent us from driving to the point of drowsiness. We got a little sleep back there. The two of us should be fine. You know, I don't think Ben ever actually talked in that way uh, to to uh, the, the two actual women that went with us. Um... I think I was just trying to get his voice that he often, uh, that people are familiar with. Um, he he did get sort of nasty towards them, but I don't think it was as vocal as and as uh, prolific as I just made it. Uh, and, then, and then it says, speak for yourself. I just told you I haven't slept yet, but 
but I trust myself more than I do that one. He points his finger at Amber and then jolts the tip in her direction for a bit more accent. You have exactly the same reasons as Franklin for wanting them out of the front seat, yet in voicing these opinions, Franklin comes across pretty damn harsh and self-exalting. It sounds as if your reasoning is a bit more reasonable. At the time, you thought these precautions had to do with your wonderfully protective and responsible natural instincts, but perhaps you were and are as self-exalting as Franklin Famous. Oh, there it is. Uh, I'm, I wasn't wrong about what I was trying to write about. He is just more honest. Although, in his particular case, no matter what the varying intentions may be, the primary concern is the same. The two of you do not want anybody to die. In about eight years, you will drive around 100 miles an hour through South Dakota, dodging death in the Badlands, in the Badlands, plowing through sheets of rain and swerving around bolts of lightning, blaring the demo of semi-famous's newly anticipated release after a two-year hiatus, while taking your baby sister Joan to Seattle. It is funny how morals and priorities can alter over short periods of time. Uh, that is my sister Jeannie, and uh, I did. I drove her to Seattle. She moved there. And the album was, uh, it was, yeah, Bark Like a Dog. You feel a bump from behind. You're surprised to discover that you are standing in the middle of an intersection. A small crowd of straight-edge punks pass through you, two or three of them proudly displaying their tattooed X's on their hands. They walk over the curb onto the sidewalk and kick the soda bottle into the street. It crashes against the curb across from you. Your gaze moves from the glass fragments to the face of the man with a newspaper for a hat. How did you get from over there into the middle of the street? You quickly step back onto the safety of the sidewalk and slowly inch your way back toward the man at the bench. He's looking at you, listening to your thoughts. You look through the window of the Middle Eastern Cafe. The band has stopped. They hold their instruments at their side. They are staring out the window. Uh, once again, I... I I, I think I've said this before, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna highlight it again that um, I I wanted the sort of the switches in time to be more jolting or, or or shocking or or smooth in some ways where you didn't know where I was uh, because I got sick and tired of a lot of those movies that they're playing with time but then they put on the screen seven years earlier or now we're back in time and the, you know. So I wanted to, as little as possible, I mentioned a little bit here, like years later or years forward, but I try not to do it that much. Okay. We're waiting. For what? They all point at you. Waiting for me? Why? To do what? To leave so that we can continue. It is amazing that they can be heard through the glass. They aren't even yelling. The man with the newspaper for a hat takes a step closer to you. He is standing on the tip of your foot, his dirty toes leaving distinctive spirally into identification prints on the tip of your shoes. You are not supposed to be here right now. You're supposed to be in the past, reflecting on a future event that is still in the past. The man is actually talking to you. In your misconception of this potentially implausible moment, he was supposed to be gentile in manner, with a gruff but pleasing voice, a jolly yet pensive homeless man, perhaps with a brain loaded with meandering, shockingly insightful ponderances. But he has a high, squeaky voice, talking rapidly with wrath boiling over in his bellowing tone, and carelessly punctuated words. His sudden abrasive declamation caused you to respond without forethought. What? I thought I was supposed to stay in the present tense. Are you saying I'm not really here? If that is true... If I am not in the street corner, on the street corner in Boston, where am I? Where am I, huh? This is bullshit. Where the fuck am I then? I don't know. I'm supposed to be listening to this band. That's all I know. What do you want from me? It's the straight edgers' fault. I. Oh, yes. Let's blame the straight edgers. He then pauses and for a second. Deep in his irises you can see yourself. The cars passing in the background are even visible. The two images of you standing and the cars passing without the correct perceptions of distance appear to happen in the same space. What the fuck is a straight edger? I don't care who the fuck is to blame. 
His paper hat shifts slightly, covering one eye. Water pours off the top of the hat and oozes down his face like clear blood. When it reaches his nose, it drips onto his upper lip and spills from his mouth to the ground, as if it were an endless stream of saliva. It is best just to calm yourself down. A calm mind can better understand the disorder. The drummer from behind the glass spins toward you on his drum stool. It is very confusing, but actually you are not, or are not, the reflector reflecting, but the recipient of a reflection. So, you were, or is it are, being told something about, in seven months, you will take a trip. About 127 miles an hour through South Dakota, dodging death in the mountains, swerving through blankets of sleet, sliding on patches of black ice, blaring the demo of Sema Famous's new anti anticipated release after a three-year breakup while escorting your older sister, Joan, to Seattle. It's funny how morals and priorities alter over short periods of time. That's also funny because uh, I don't know why I changed it to my older sister, Joan. It's actually, I, probably because, like a lot of things, I want them to sound but be different because older sister, Joan, is actually younger sister, Jean. Anyway. You feel a bump from behind. You're standing in the middle of the street again. A small crowd of frat boys pass through you, two or three of them proudly displaying their school collars and holding half-full bottles of Miller in their hands. One of them kicks the bottle of pop into the street, and it crashes against the curb. A car is honking. If you notice that uh, each time it comes back to this moment of me in the street, it's a different group of people that are passing by. Uh, that's on purpose. A car is honking. You sprint over to the sidewalk and speed walk back to the safety of the bench. Your gaze moves from the glass fragments to the face of the man with a newspaper for a hat. He is looking at you, listening to your thoughts. You look through the window of the Middle Eastern Cafe. The band has stopped. They hold their instruments at their sides. They are staring at you. You were doing so well, says the guitarist. What happened? What? It is best to remain calm, but you had already told yourself that. It didn't help. It's not helping. You are quite lost. Do you want me to pick a fucking piece of glass up from this curb and slit your punk boy puss with it? The man with a newspaper for a hat moves toward the street. The glass fragments melt before his very eyes and flow into the sewer carried by the rain as he bends down to pick one up. Fuck! He splashes his hand in the water, desperately grasping for nothing. The drummer spins around on his stool. You need to concentrate a little harder. He places his hands together as if he is going to pray to God for your forgiveness. Now, you are at your house with Mr. Famous and Swindopoller, thinking about your meeting with them in the future. No. That's not possible. It must have been your meeting with them in the past at the ashtray. Ashtray? That doesn't sound right to you. You correct him. You mean the tar pit? Whatever. He is insulted by the correction. No, says the guitarist. He's in a minibus driving through North Dakota. No, says the bassist. You're both wrong. He's sitting in a fetal position with his back pressed against the wall, right around the corner from here, getting water in his eye. He is contemplating the effect of the large argument of the van in L.A., and how that comment from Mr. Famous about the rest of the band being monkeys could have eventually led to, this, could, could have eventually led to the slow corroding of all the friendships. No, says the drummer. Yes, that most definitely happened in the past. Yes, you're right, insists the drummer, but that exact past in this guy's present past hasn't happened yet. <laughs> the man with a newspaper for a hat limps over to the window of the Middle Eastern Cafe. Fuck all of you. Give me those goddamn instruments if you're not going to play. I'll bash his fucking skull in with... He tries to choose between all the possible musical weapons, his head swishing from one side to the other, dipping in and out of the window with his hat remarkably staying in place. With this fucking thing. He reaches through the glass for the cymbal stand. As soon as he grasps it in his fist, the metal stand melts away and the cymbal, now suspended by nothing, hits his hand and crashes to the ground. 
It smashes into a soft powder and disappears between the thin cracks in the stage. Fuck! Now look what you've drawn, done. The drummer pokes his drumstick through the malleable liquid window and waves it in the face of the man with the newspaper fur hat. How am I supposed to finish this song without my cymbal? You look over at their small audience. Their heads are bopping back and forth as if they were still listening to the animated rhythm of a band. The man with the newspaper for a hat grabs the drumstick. It vanishes. Fucking fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck! Oh, great, mumbles the miffed drummer. The bass player and guitarist dive over the drums, knocking the drummer off his stool. They land on top of the man with the newspaper for a hat and begin pummeling him. Some chance punches connect and others pass randomly through his head. The audience bopping back and forth begins to sing in unison. In about one score three years, la la la, you will drive 250 miles an hour through Washington, D.C. Whoa, 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 running red lights, knocking down stop signs, sideswiping pedestrians, a dee dee da, with Hitchhiker Joan by your side. Dramatic pause. It's funny how our morals and priorities alter over short. Huh! <laughs> you are knocked to the ground. The glass of soda jabs you in the back. The musicians and the man with the newspaper for a hat are on top of you, kicking, scratching, biting. Your back is soaked from the puddle you are lying in. The weight of the musicians is forcing you down into the puddle. Is it possible to drown in a puddle? How high does water have to be to drown? It is hard to breathe. You are sweating. The sweat and rain raises the level of the puddle. Your forehead is boiling. Your skin feels as if it is crawling off its bones. There's no more air for your lungs. Yes, there is, but only enough to yell, Get off me! Pause. The man with the newspaper for a hat is sitting calmly on the bench. He looks over at you casually, and then looks back at the band playing on the other side of the Middle Eastern Cafe's window. He takes a swig from his bottle. You look toward your right hand, which is pressed against the wet ground. The soda bottle, the soda bottle is spinning sputtering in a, mud, in a puddle. A sudden chill races down your spine, back up again into your right arm, then spreads into your fingertips, and feels as if it is sending an electrical current across the wet ground into the puddle. You look up just in time to see yourself turning the corner of the Middle Eastern Cafe. You witness yourself seeing for the first time the man sitting on a bench with a drenched newspaper over his head. My God, I have, like... <laughs> two different timelines going at the same time and also like alternative realities uh, all happening at once. I was really taking out the big guns during this book. <laughs> anyway, when you stand up to approach yourself, you notice a soft voice whispering, fluctuating in loudness, quickly from far away to close to far away. You can't make out what it is saying. Where is it coming from? You look at yourself standing by the man on the bench. You are looking over toward you, not at you, but beside you, toward the ground. You look down. The soft, whispering voice is coming from the bottle. The spinning is causing the voice to fluctuate in tone and volume. You stand there and stare at it for a while, spellbound. Because, even though you are the main focus of this confusion, it is still possible to enjoy the oddness that engulfs you. You pick up the bottle and put the top part to your ear like a tourist would with a seashell found in the sand. The voice is much clearer now. End of chapter 13, book 1. Um, that's pretty fun. Uh, most of this is, this I think is one of the, maybe the only chapters that is complete fiction, except for the part uh, where it just touches on uh, the the road trip that we took across the country with our friends, uh, me and Ben and his Chevy Malibu, uh, drove uh, what is it like two thousand miles to uh, our first gig in Gilman Gilman our first gig at Gil Gilman Street. So that part is true. And then uh, it reminded me of the time I drove my sister across the country after just recording "Bark Like a Dog." For, so those th incidences are true, but all of this weird bizarre stuff uh with the times overlapping and uh me on the corner 
I think it was just me just having a lot of fun with writing. And also it's it sort of does foreshadow the uh foreshadow the parallel between Ben's book and my book of the death of me. <laughs> Uh, so thanks very much. I'm glad to be back reading this. It's pretty enjoyable. Uh, so thanks for listening. And Matt, I hope this puts you to sleep. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Banazic. Banazic. So Banazic, B-A-N-A-U-S-I-C, uh, is an adjective, formal, and the meaning is not operating on a refined or elevated level, mundane. So it is, I think, maybe slightly related to the word banal. Um, so that's the only comments I have on that last chapter. The other thing I would like to say is that I've started a Patreon. Um, it's specifically for my Jughead's Basement, where I do interviews of bands uh, and do these very extensive uh, histories of particular records, mostly about punk bands and other bands that influenced me and records that influenced me. And I'm also doing interviews with uh, comedians and uh, people in the performance industry, um, like writers and also behind the scenes folk. Um, I'm finding it more and more difficult to find the time to do these because of not having uh, finances. So I've started the Patreon to try to get some help so that I can actually spend more time bringing uh, products to you to, to listen to. So if you enjoy any of the things I do, whether it's the Weasels in the Box or whether it's the study of uh, all the records that I've been on or the interviews that I do with other bands or other performers, please, uh, if you can, spare some cash and uh, sign up for my Patreon, which will be in the notes below. Thank you very much, everybody. I don't think that I'll ever forget the way you were tonight.